At the edge of the Epestas Peninsula lies the great kingdom of Hortensia. Thanks to Olivier and Camellia acting as the sword and shield, they're a powerhouse country. Well, that's until Archduke Rugas betrayed them and killed Dukes Fernando, Leon plus the king. To make matters worse, Princess Mariel, the eldest of the royal siblings, is missing. Four years later, Fernando's son, Alfred Albert is now a Duke of the Albert Dominion and a royal knight. With him is his squire and page, Marius Castored, the boy that Sir Maurice Baudelaire, Fernando's brother, and Alfred's uncle, had saved during the rebellion. Together, these two warriors will shape the future of the Kingdom of Hortensia, well, sort of. The year is 771 of the New Holy Era and the new Lord of Albert Dominion, Duke Alfred Albert, leads his forces towards Earp Heights, an area where the Hortensian army is currently trapped by the Camellian forces. Together with his squire, Marius, and his retainer and trainer, Sir Morris, the party leads their troops to save the trapped Hortensian soldiers. Arriving at the heights the group finds nothing but a pile of corpses, a massacre. Alfred scans for survivors and sees two soldiers who are hiding behind a large outcrop. But before they can do anything, they eat a bunch of arrows coming straight from Camellia's elite archer units. Alfred still wants to rescue the two soldiers, but a Camellian unit ambushes them. Alfred and Marius fight against the Camellian mobs and manage to kill them. But as soon as the survivors start walking away, two arrows come from behind, killing both of them. The enemy commander appears on top of the outcrop and it's Roy Bacalot, a redhead Camellian troop commander and an elite archer. Alfred and Marius confront Roy, asking him why he needs to kill the survivors. But Roy responds with a cold-hearted answer, telling them it's war. This offends Marius and goes after Roy. With Marius' weak thrusts and slashes, he's no match for our boy Roy. He makes his huge ass bow looks like a long-range shotgun, as he's throwing shots at Marius at close range. Alfred comes to Marius' aid, but Roy defeats him as well. As Roy is about to put down the two warriors, Sir Morris throws his axe and saves the boys. And since their objective is complete, Roy orders his forces to retreat, leaving the battlefield immediately. Later that day, the group goes home and Marius wakes up after being knocked down during the fight. Alfred kneels on his family's grave, talking about chivalry and all that nonsense after getting a fat L from Roy earlier. Marius finds Alfred and the two tell each other that they'll get stronger to protect their loved ones. Magania is a mythical paradise that has this grand and supreme power that can grant anyone whatever they wish for. One month has passed since the battle at the Earp Heights. Our heroes, Duke Alfred and Sir Morris are out there playing Goblin Slayer without a party of kids getting wiped out. While Marius and Non-Noria are doing the legwork of carrying flowers and herbs, Marius and Non-Noria arrive at one of the villages, with Morris and Alfred arriving just a few minutes late. The group sees two kids quarreling about a shapeshifting monster hiding inside the Tron cave not far from the village. The group greets the kids and tells them not to wander around too far from the village unless they want the soil to be their permanent bed. After visiting the village, the group heads back to the mansion and Alfred tells everyone that they should check the cave out. Arriving at the cave, Alfred's party fights off against goblins while Non-Noria rushes to the cave because the mom of one of the kids earlier went out to the cave solo. While inside the cave, Non-Noria finds the lost boy from the village earlier, but the two of them get trapped as monsters swarm into their position. Alfred, Marius, and Morris arrive just in time to save them. Before leaving, the group checks out the glowing part of the cave finding themselves at the mouth of the legendary cave spring. There, they find the apparition of a werewolf, who attacks both Alfred and Marius. Alfred retaliates and attacks the werewolf, consumed by blind rage, but Morris stops him. Due to the royal trauma and fear that the werewolf who killed her dad had induced in Marius, she falls unconscious into the spring's waters. Alfred saves Marius and the group leaves the cave. The kid is safe and the group returns to the village reuniting the kid back with his mother. The next day, Alfred and Morris head back to the capital to answer Captain Jorg Dalma's summons, the ecclesiastical order's commander. Captain Jorg tells them to secretly investigate the Petale village, which is currently under quarantine due to the petrodermic plague that's all over the place. As part of the ecclesiastical order, Jorg tells them that he can't really call for an emergency meeting right now. Four years ago, the revered Pope Alexis Val de Hebron crowned the child Prince Charlotte de Hortensia as the rightful ruler of the kingdom, effectively becoming his regent. We'll just call him Pope Lebron since his name is pretty hard to remember. Ever since his political power starts to expand, the ecclesiastical knights have been doing some pretty nasty stuff all over the kingdom and Captain Jorg is trying to get some pieces of evidence on this. He tells them there might be something in the Petale village that's worth looking out for. And so Alfred and Morris agree to check out the village, fetching Marius along the way. Arriving at the village, the group immediately sees the blockage built by the order. While looking around, the group hears someone getting a vibe check and rushes to where the sound is coming from. 
In the middle of the horde of flesh-eating monsters, a spear-wielding man jumps out of the undead group cornering him, retreating away to a safe distance. Happy rip-off guy tells Marius to do the incantation chant to freeze the undead in place, but it has no effect at all, triggering all of them to attack Marius. Morris swoops in and saves Marius, while Alfred deals with the other undead. One by one, the undead falls to Alfred's masterful swordsmanship. After defeating the zombies, the spear guy asks them who they are and what they're doing in the village. Marius tells him they're from the Orthodox Church, which angers the guy. The guy goes after Marius, but Morris stops him, and so he leaves instead, warning them not to get in his way. Continuing their investigation, the group finds their way into the village church. There, they find the same man earlier mourning for his neighbors. Morris asks his name and the man introduces himself as Deflot Danois. Deflot learns from Morris what happened and why there are undead in his village. The group continues their search and upon entering the church, they find the priest's diary. The diary reveals that Deflot is the village priest's son who ran away a few years before the outbreak. After learning the fate of his village, Deflot and the group go outside to mourn but it is cut short when the ecclesiastical knights arrive to arrest them. The commander orders the knights to attack them, but Alfred stops one of the knights, telling them it's Deflot's right to mourn his dead neighbors. Before Alfred and the Order's swords could even cross, a large zombie guy with spider legs appears and jumps onto the knights, removing them from the scene. Now the group will have to deal with Rachna Kadaki looking ass. So Alfred, Deflot, and Morris simultaneously attack the zombie spider dude. But the monster's regenerative abilities are insane. So Marius recites the rites of the dead once again. But this time around, he has the correct flower. The chant finally works and burns the monster, giving Alfred and Deflot enough time to bring it down. After the fight, Alfred and the gang help Deflot with his village cemetery cleanup, recruiting him afterward. Alfred, Deflot, Marius, and Morris all head back to the capital to report back to Captain Jorg about their findings. On their way, the group finds a wrecked caravan. Looking inside one of the wagons, Alfred finds the Deirehen twins hiding within the cargo. Alfred takes the kids and leave for the capital once again. The gang arrives at the capital and meets Captain Bertrand, another captain of the Royal Knights. The captain tells Alfred to take the children to the orphanage and so Alfred orders Marius and Deflot to accompany Captain Bertrand to the place. While walking, the twins disappear and Marius didn't notice their absence. Alfred and Morris deliver their report, but the monsters start spawning near the cathedral endangering the Pope and killing the citizens nearby. So the three of them rush outside and meet Bertrand, Deflot, and Marius. The knights manage to defeat the monsters outside quickly and so they rush towards the cathedral doors, only to find out that the twins that Alfred saved yesterday are the ones behind the monster summoning. Realizing his mistake, Alfred raises his sword against the Chameleon assassins, but the twins shoot a projectile toward the group, destroying their initiative. As the twins are about to summon the same monsters again, the Pope casts Holy, dispelling their magic. The twins are defeated but a dragon appears and lands inside the cathedral. Sir Didier the Black Knight appears and basically tells everyone hold on. Bro, I got this. So he starts slicing and dicing the dragon, managing to put it down. But the dragon going down is just another setup for the twins to hop onto, escaping the capital without so much as a scratch. A couple of weeks have passed since the attack, and our heroes are visiting the current Lord of Olivier Dominion the adoptive daughter of the late Sir Leon D. Olivier, Commander Adelhaid Olivier. Upon meeting Adelhaid, Alfred informs her that Captain Jorg wants her support as two factions are currently struggling for power in the capital. One is the Hortensian Orthodox Church led by the Pope and the other is the Moderate Sect, which consists of the regular Templar Knights and Royal Guards, who are still loyal to the previous crown. Adelhaid understands the situation but tells them they need to wait as Chameleon spies are on her tail for weeks now and acting right off the bat might spell danger for her citizens. Suddenly, the ecclesiastical knights appear in the Olivier Dominion and start witch hunting, forcing women and children out of their houses under the suspicion of being a witch. Alfred and Adelhaid see this and so the two try to stop what they're doing. Sir Didier appears and asks Adelhaid why she's still looking for Princess Mariel, accusing her that her plan is probably to use the princess for her interests raising his sword against her. Deflot and Marius cannot stand this bullshit and quickly come into action, guarding the accused women. However, when Alfred's about to draw his sword, Didier warns him that doing so will make him the enemy of the church. Adelhaid offers them to take her instead as she's the one they're trying to incriminate anyway. But as soon as she's taken, the same dragon appears and the Chameleon forces invade the kingdom. Adelhaid tells the knights to release her as her capture means pointing a sword straight at the capital's neck. Didier agrees and tells the knights to release her, and so Adelhaid quickly mobilizes her forces to repel the invasion. With the help of the Order's knights and Alfred's party, Roy Bacalot appears once more and Adelhaid confronts him, 
Alfred and Marius see them fighting and rush towards her aid trying to 3 vs. 1 Roy, who just orders everyone to retreat. Then he claims he did everything to protect Adelheid and leaves. As the battle concludes, Didier and the knights still take Adelheid as a prisoner. But Alfred argues that Adelheid proved her loyalty to the kingdom by defending Olivier. Taking her now will be a death sentence in the future. Didier sees the logic behind Alfred's words and agrees to leave her alone but tells her she's not completely out of the woods yet. A couple of weeks have passed since they visited Olivier and Alfred and his party travels to Juin Island to investigate a woman claiming to be Princess Mariel. The group finds out that the woman has a volunteer army rallying under her banner, so after she gives her address, the group goes after her. Alfred and his party arrive inside her room and confronts her. The woman introduces herself as Marie and apologizes for impersonating the princess as she only did it to give hope to her people. Marius offers to help her out and by doing so, Marie and Jim decide to reveal the truth to the public, and so the fake knight and princess tell everyone their dupes, which enraged the people. But the Daheran assassins are back at it again, possessing the toy giant that Jim and Marie made to make people believe in the princess, and the giant legend. The assassins summon the monsters again, but thanks to Alfred, Marius, and their party's help, Marie is safe. As the giant toy falls, the real giant of the legend appears and saves Marius from being crushed, taking the giant toy underground. The next day, Alfred and his party prepare to leave the island. Jim and Marie thank them for helping them sort things out. Before leaving, Marie tells Marius that if he ever needs help, she and the rest of the volunteer army are going to help her. Moving forward, after hearing from the traders that Kokon village is now abandoned, Alfred, Deflot, and Marius leave to investigate the medicinal herb-producing city. Upon arriving, they learn from one of the villagers that the Orthodox Church has been in control for two years now and a former village priest, Adele, takes them to the Knoll Hospital. Adele tells them he's part of the expeditionary corps sent to help the petrodermic plague victims of the Petale village but his work is far more sinister. He goes to Kokon to atone for his sins. Adele reveals that most of the petrodermic patients are inside the hospital and are there by design as the church wants to cover it up since the plague is basically incurable, and so Marius and Deflot agree to follow Adele. But Alfred stops them, telling them that they need to report back to Captain Jorg before making a move. He's obviously afraid of the power of the church, but they move on anyway. Underground, the group finds themselves surrounded by zombies but they manage to quickly defeat them before heading towards the basement. Upon reaching the place, the group sees the patients just lying on the floor, without any kind of treatment. As soon as the group's about to leave, Gaston, a tall and humongous bodyguard shows up and confronts them. Gaston attacks Deflot, but Deflot manages to wound Gaston. But it's super ineffective as this dude's powered up by Dr. Graf steroids. Dr. Graf tells them he's just acting under the Pope's orders, which angers Deflot even further. Deflot tells Alfred to flee since he has to protect Albert's people. Being caught here is a death sentence for its citizens. But as soon as Deflot takes a massive beating from Gaston, Marius shows up to defend him. Seeing Marius' dedication and resolve, Alfred finally shows up and decides to raise his sword against the Order. However, Sir Didier appears once again, thwarting his plans. Didier defeats the trio, but as soon as Marius hits the wall, he immediately recognizes that Marius is actually the lost Princess Mariel. Didier takes her and the knights capture Alfred and Deflot. One month later and both Alfred and Deflot are stuck in the ferry tour prison. There, they meet Lucan, Alfred's friend. He reveals that Marius will be executed soon. As soon as Alfred and Deflot move into the Tower of Justice, Alfred stages an escape and runs toward Marius. Well, they are successful, but the knights corner them. Meanwhile, Didier undid Princess Mariel's binds. He tells her that she's going to die, but reveals the truth about what happened a few years ago before even Ruga's betrayal happens. The king committed a taboo by trying to revive his hot wife using the Maganian scroll. Mariel saw this and at Didier's suggestion, he locked her memory to prevent her from doing some crazy stuff as well. Due to the king trying to revive his wife, the kingdom paid the price. Rugis turned on him by becoming a werewolf killing everyone, monsters spawned everywhere, and the rest is because they don't follow the law of equivalent exchange. Knowing all of this makes Mariel weak and frustrated. She knows she didn't do this, but her father's greed made everyone suffer, so yeah, she gives up on life. Back to our duo, the knights corner them, but Morris does a clutch save. Before leaving the prison, Morris tells the two to go on ahead as he faces Lucan, the same warden earlier. Getting in his night drip, Alfred and Deflot rush towards the execution grounds, saving the princess before she's necked by death. Soon, Olivier's forces led by Adelheid and Bertrand's squad 4 arrive as well, 
saving the princess. Later that day, Marius reveals she's the real Princess Mariel. Alfred kneels and vows to become her sword forever. With the word that Princess Mariel is alive, Rubies makes his move and rallies towards the capital. Before marching to the capital, Adelheid leads the group towards a lone shack inside the Olivier Kingdom. There, Princess Mariel meets Lacroix, a Maganian sentinel. She's basically the witch that the church is hunting, so the witch hunting is sort of valid. Lacroix unlocks a core ability inside Mariel by making her undergo a Maganian trial to see if she has a lust for power or not. The trial goes well and Mariel is all clear, and so the group heads to the capital to do some Avengers level stuff. Taking the fight to the Pope cause religion is bad. On the way to the capital, the coalition forces under Princess Mariel's banner encounter the Chameleon forces. The two opposing armies form an unofficial alliance, intending to take the Pope's head. Near one of the bridges leading to the capital, the coalition forces are stopped by Grand Captain Balthasar's forces, led by none other than his grandson, Flegel. The elite Templar Knights give the coalition forces a hard time, but Alfred's splinter group manages to sneak into the elite army's flank, surprising them with a sneak attack. Gigachad Roy Bacalot appears once again, providing fire cover for Alfred's forces and dismantling the enemy Templar Knight's positions. With the enemy flanked, Adelheid and the other commanders order their soldiers to charge forward, doing a pincer move against Flegel's elite forces. Hours later and Flegel's forces are routed. With Flegel's defeat, the coalition forces arrive at the capital rather smoothly. Commander Balthasar shows up and reinforces their troops further. Everything's going smoothly, until Captain Jorg, the commander of the Moderates Templar Knights show up and causes disarray in the coalition forces. Alfred, Deflot, and Morris try to save their trapped comrades by Morris going after Jorg himself while Alfred and Deflot whittle the enemy groups trapping their troops. However, Didier shows up once again and takes on Alfred. Didier sends Alfred flying, so Adelheid takes over and duels him. But she's no match for him. Didier goads them to 3v1 him, but all three of them are severely outclassed by the Black Knight. As Didier's about to kill Alfred, Mariel steps up and blocks his attack. So he throws Mariel to the side, posing to strike her. But Alfred uses his body as a shield. And just as Didier's about to strike Alfred down, Mariel suddenly unlocks her power, blinding Didier with her radiant light which is the chance that Alfred needed to strike back. In one fell swoop, Alfred strikes Didier down, but he manages to escape using his teleportation magic. Back in the gates, Jorg reveals that he used to work with the Pope back then, and apparently, the Pope was secretly the son of the late king but was neglected by the king for another family. After their briefing, Balthasar tells them that they'll have to sneak into the castle underground to face the Pope. And so the group goes inside the underground passage, but the zombies appear once again to block their path. Deflot tells them to go ahead without him while he plays hero, killing all the zombies. Alfred, Mariel, and Morris arrive in the castle hallways, but Adelheid leaves them behind as she tells them that someone's calling for her out. The group moves forward and meets the zombified late Sir Fernando. Alfred's father, revived by Magania's power. Alfred clashes swords with his father, and reuniting with him a little bit makes Alfred lower his guard down. But Morris saves him, telling Fernando of the oath he swore to him back then. After hearing the exchange of words between the brothers, Alfred raises his sword to block his father's attack, releasing him from his possession by stabbing him. Fernando's ghost bids Alfred goodbye and Alfred promises him that he'll make a better future together with the princess. Moving forward, Alfred and Mariel rush to the throne room and find Charlotte who's already back to normal after the Pope relinquishes his control over him. Alfred thanks the Pope for giving him the chance to talk to his father and for indirectly giving him the strength to carry his father's legacy. He then asks the Pope what his plans are and the Pope just spits some nonsense and transforms into an evil demon woman and summons evil demon women. The power couple tries to attack the demon Pope, but deals zero damage. The Pope retaliates by using his Maganian powers, subduing the duo. However, Duke Ruga's dad killer Camellia arrives and saves the two. With their combined power, the trio kills the demon Pope. After the fight, Ruga's kneels in front of Princess Mariel. The princess tells him that she needs people to help her re-establish order, and that they need to get rid of the scroll. However, the Pope has one more trick up his holy sleeves, as the crystal in his forehead shatters, turning the sky crimson red. The Pope reveals that the scroll is no longer with him as it's Didier's relic to begin with. This event triggers Rugas to transform into the same werewolf that killed both Alfred and Mariel's dad, killing the Pope and attacking both Alfred and Mariel. Alfred charges forward to kill Rugas, stabbing his chest. But Rugas counters with an uppercut slash, wounding Alfred severely. Rugas then flees the scene once again. As Alfred lay dying, he tells the princess that he managed to complete his task and his oath as her sword. In his final words, Alfred calls her Marius one last time and asks her to go home together with him 
Then he dies. Several days have passed and Mariel rises to become the kingdom's saver, giving hope to the people of their once great nation. Together, with her fully revived knight Alfred, they'll shape the future, in which Alfred is probably the villain. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.